I'm going to jump right into it. So like, you know, there's a lot going on in the world right now. I, I think like these types of events, I think are really important. Um, back when I was kind of growing up and starting to like understand commercial industry, coming out of government, like there was always Hadoop World. I don't know if anyone here used to go to Hadoop World, but that was always where we went, right? And we talked about technology, we talked about partnerships, and it was this massive event. It was, it all started with, it was like 100 people in New York Times Square, Hilton, right? Um, it was super nerdy and weird, um, and it was good. Um, obviously, marketing has changed a bit with the amount of digital out there. And so, you know, the whole point of this activity here is to get a smaller group of people together. We don't want it to be hundreds of people. We want it to be communal and we want you to talk, right? Because every single one of you are spending an exorbitant amount of capital investing in cloud compute technologies and you can all learn from each other. And we constantly see that every day, right? And so like our goal as a business is, listen, I mean, first and foremost, we win if you win, right? If you're successful, we're successful. So our goal is to bring you together to learn from one another and to implement you know, consistent and successful strategies. Because um, pattern matching is everything, right? Um, what I'm specifically here to talk about is this data security in the modern data stack. Um, the one thing I will not do, you will not see once in here, is me pitching a muta. That will not happen. Um, and I'll be very honest. Very, very honest, brutally honest. And if you want to ask me any questions in the middle of this too, feel free to do that. We've built time to do that. Um, so just stop me. That's okay. Um, and the, the reason you know, we're, we're seeing these massive changes, right? So like, the first question is, why are all of you moving to cloud infrastructure, right? Like, you know, I've heard stories where you literally can't buy any more Dell servers from one bank, right? They're, you can't expand Teradata anymore. So it's not possible. Hopefully no one is from Teradata in here, because um, they're screwed. Um, but like, the, the point being though is, is that like as we're moving is, the first thing is we want to get any user on any data, right? And that's global in nature, right? I think what we saw with COVID was we have a very disparate workforce now. And so users are having to VPN in. How many times has someone like had to VPN and wait 30 minutes for a job to run? It's miserable, right? And so what we're seeing is, is we're leveraging cloud to make a distributed workforce operational. Um, and that distributed workforce could be any user. I think the tools that, they, that corporations have now, um, there's easy button data science, there's you know, Excel on steroids. The ability for the average user to be able to work through data has completely changed over the past five to six years. It's been really rapid, right? This isn't like running, writing a MapReduce job anymore. Um, SQL's taken over, it's much easier. And so what's happening is, is data's become the new app, right? We're hearing this concept of data product managers. There's, your lines of business are starting to look at data assets and build domains. And we, you hear a lot about data mesh and the, the ideology behind this is, is that, listen, the business understands their data. They're getting out of the business of trying to be IT and they're trying to get into the business of what they know best, which is how do we leverage our data to make more money, right? If we weren't here, like as a business, you're trying to drive top line revenue. Um, so like the point here is, is we have to start really reshaping how we look at the world. Rather than storage, we have to look at how we're gonna use that data and make it available. Um, rather than doing things manually, we're trying to automate everything to allow those end users to do more data analysis, right? And we wanna be able to work collaboratively. We don't wanna to have to separate silos in an organization um, ask each other for the data right towards custom application APIs. We want to just be able to get access to each other's data, merge it together, and do something with it, right? Um, and we're getting out of this game of like, I forget how many times I heard someone say, oh, I just need like a Google for enterprise, right? We're getting out of this game of search, right? And we're getting into the game of transform, right? Companies like DBT are exploding because everyone wants to transform the data into something that is easily queryable through really simple SQL language, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. And so that's this new world we live in. But as we're doing that, what's most important to understand here is, is but we need a customer 360. We need to get more personal, right? As we want to drive automation, we need to learn more about unique telemetry about our consumers or about our partners or about name your other entity type, right? And so when we move from like web data era, which is all about search and context, now it's about precision. And that precision requires volumes and volumes, lots and lots and lots of little data. It's not about big data anymore, it's lots of little data. And that's scary as hell because, I mean, 
I mean, I just see what my kids put on the internet and they're six and nine. I can't imagine what teenagers are putting on there and I can't imagine what 20 year olds are putting on there. And so that personal data, we can't, we're collecting at such a volume, we don't even know what we have and we don't understand the risk we're taking. And so what's happening is the government, in theory, if the government decides to load, um, the government is stepping in, right? So no matter which country you look at, whether it's data sovereignty laws like a China or Brazil or a Japan or an Australia, they're putting in rules around where you can exfil data out of there, right? Um, in other cases, we're seeing things like, I, bet, I guarantee you in the next two or three years, I've been saying this for two or three years, so bear with me, but like the Child's Online Privacy Protection Act, COPA, out of like California, I guarantee you media companies are going to start really caring about that because your kid can be on a PS5 in the back of an SUV and they're recording their voice, they're recording all of their biometrics about your kids. And so that's gonna be an issue and we can't stop it because that's the way we do fraud prevention around your dang kid spending $100 at a time pressing a button to buy something on Fortnite, right? And so the point is legislation's moving forward and it's moving forward at a pace that organizations that are in here aren't used to changing. Right? It's happening at a one to two year pace. And we, don't, we can't turn over our enterprises that fast. And so you have to think about, when you're thinking about security, and security to me is an umbrella term, when it comes to data security, we're thinking about privacy, we're thinking about pure access, like business logic. How does our bank, how does our insurance company, how does our pharmaceutical company, how are we gonna put business rules, who, who internal can access it? And then we have contractual obligations, like we bring our own data. We have many quants in banks who are gonna go get their own data from open source and bring that in. How do we treat that? So we have contractual obligations on that. And then finally, we have regulatory. I think far too much we talk about regulatory and brand, but we don't talk about data contracts and we don't talk about the internal business rules. And so to get to these three kind of pillars of this world of security, we have to think, one, it has to scale with compute. Right? Remember, we have lots and lots of little data sources with lots and lots of points of, of potential security risk in that data. The second is it has to be interdisciplinary. You can't have just security engineers or just data engineers or just data scientists or just policy. It's everyone. And the problem is, is not every user has an entry point into this. Right? So they all have to have their own interface and their own workflows, but they have to work together. And that sounds crazy, but if you go back to like a Salesforce, Right? Salesforce has an entry point for finance, has an entry point for marketing, has an entry point for sales. At least my sales is supposed to go in there and update stuff, not all the time. But like the point being is, is it has workflows for those users to work together, right? And the third is risk. And this is the most important thing, is what we're about to see is the, the emergence of identity, so authentication and authorization merge in real time, right? And that's something, and by, what I mean by that, and I'll walk through it in a minute here is, is that the way we used to look at security and the, the whole concept of zero, uh, everyone familiar with zero trust, although I think it's kind of a bullshit term, but like, are you generally familiar with zero trust where you protect every endpoint? Um, that doesn't work in data because the endpoint is every user, every query, and every potential data source at any moment in time. You can't, I mean, no one would be able to operate efficiently if you had to literally dual factor authenticate everything you're doing, right? It just wouldn't work. And so how do we deal with that paradigm is the question. And so you have to meet those three pillars. And so if you think about the old way we did things, we built apps, right? And those apps, we would, and for those of us who had to build these apps, this was miserable, right? Because what you would do is you build your database, you load all your data in there in a development environment, and then you'd build a GUI and, and web tier around that, and then you go to then security and hope to God that security lets you through this myriad of checklists of stuff, right? And then rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. And for those from JP Morgan, you had 8,300 and change applications in your organization. And so it was this never ending process, right? And it was so costly. And so then move forward. We say, oh, we're gonna introduce this concept of, first it came Redshift, and then there was BigQuery. And then we got Snowflake, and then we got Databricks, and then, and then, and then, right? So now we have the big six, I call it the big six. And these cloud compute vendors are saying all the same thing, right? So for those in the room, I love all your tools, but it's all the same thing. And it's essentially, we're gonna converge all your silos of data, we're gonna break it down, we're gonna unify access to that, and we're gonna make it so any modern BI or data science tool 
can get direct access in a polyglot format to it, right? Boom, there's your big six, right? That's their pitch. It works, right? The problem with that, though, is you don't see those little nice brown box of policy over there. And the other problem is this. For every app, let's just say there was 100 policies in there. Let's say some data contracts, some regulatory controls. The problem is it's not a one-for-one -one match when you move into the cloud. Because all of a sudden, I could potentially converge it with other data. So all these combinations add up. And so if you think about the different dimensions of security, right, is I have the plat different platforms may have different rules. I have different types of data contracts, right? So I'm sharing with third parties, one of the rules there. I have different laws, geographies, add on and on. It all kind of adds up. And so when you get into this concept, this is, I think, if the first thing about scale is, this is why you have to scale with compute is, it's actually, I'm going to fast forward here, is for any user, it's actually the square. For any data source, it's the square of policy. So it's not one. If I have 100 apps and 100 policies, it's not the multiplication of that, right? So as I'm adding all these users, you get very, very quickly into a point where you're having billions of potential policies in a very short amount of time. And there's no way we can write code just to like, authorize people onto each one of those data sources and authenticate them into those systems. It's just not possible right, in this world. And so what you have to do in this zero trust dilemma right, on any potential moment is you have to merge the identity of that person and all of their attributes and you have to make a real-time decision. And so that's a new design paradigm, right? And that new design paradigm, while I'm extremely biased here, is I do not believe you can proxy to that compute fabric any longer. And that's how we did it, right? We, with these applications, when we needed, let's just say, a bunch of applications and we needed to converge that data, we virtualized it. And there were some really good companies that created virtualization concepts. And we cached that data if it was hot and people need access to it a lot. But the problem with that, though, in the modern way of working is, do I really want a compute infrastructure on top of my compute infrastructure? Right? Snowflake was not designed for that. Databricks was not designed for that. Starburst was not designed for that. Right? They don't want multiple layers of compute. And so when we have to add security logic into what they're doing, the last thing they want is someone to mess up their performance. And so they're not, they want the separation of policy from their platform but they want it embedded natively. We can no longer proxy to them because that, they're not incentivized for that to happen because they want optimal performance. And let's be honest, they want you crunching more data against them because they're gonna make more money, right? And so they're highly incentivized from an architecture to design that way, right? So you kind of have to learn and go from it. So the first kind of major lesson, I would say philosophically, in these new platforms is you have to, your policy, and policy isn't just like an Amuta. Policy is, it could be the catalogs you're investing in. It could be you know, the classifiers from data discovery if you have cu custom utilities doing that. Um, it could be all sorts of different types of observability platforms. They have to be native. They have to be built into the platform itself and learn from what's going on inside the platform. Otherwise, they will not work. They will not perform. They're not incentivized to. The second I'm going to move uh, is, is as I, I come back to the symbiotic relationships, right? As we move forward, we can't just, especially in a distressed market, right? We have to work together. Organizations are going to flatten. They're gonna say we have to all work together to deliver data to our lines of business. That's gonna be our job, right? And the problem is, is, and this will never happen, you're never gonna just randomly teach a bunch of people to write code. Their, their brain is not wired that way, right? And so whether you're a lawyer, whether you're a, a governance team member, you need an entry point to be able to work with data engineers and data scientists. And so we have to all work together around these tool sets to be able to add an entry point for those people. And specifically, when you're thinking about the different types of people, right, from a GRC, from your second and third line of defense, to the technology groups that are horizontal delivering to line of business, as well as the business itself, you need, when you come together, one thing I would tell you right now is if you're starting new projects, if you don't have a, uh, a racy chart, right, for who is responsible and accountable, who's going to be consulted and informed as part of these projects across these domains, it is going to slow you down. And it's a lot of people, which means the programmatics of these data programs are probably even more important than the actual what you're going to go build and do, right? Because if you don't have this an optimal communication channel, you will fail. 
And so when I come back and I think of from macro perspective, how do we have to design these concepts around data security and working with all these groups? The first is, is you have to be able to understand what data you have and tag it, right? If you try to manually control every column and every data source you have, that's a never ending exercise. So you have to use automation and classification to tag your data and leverage tags for a myriad of different types of governance aspects, whether it's, hey, this is a potential PAI, to, hey, this is a very specific business object and I really care about this for the business, like so quality controls, uh, there's a myriad of reasons. So you need to be able to have very mature discovery operations that have high quality outputs. The second, which you know, we can talk about at length, but when you talk about securing your data, you have to kind of break it into first the authoring aspect. Authoring, you really need to think about um, policy, as I said, business rules, contractual rules, regulatory rules. And when you get to regulatory, you have to not just be thinking about, oh, I'm writing a direct custom policy on something. You have to be thinking about what is the purpose? So why did I collect this data? And then why am I processing it? If your organization doesn't have a series of purposes with contractual obligations around it, then, then by definition, you're already breaking most regulations. And the spirit of the GDPR, CCPA, and many others is designed around purpose and intent. I always, uh, if there's any lawyers in the room, you can yell at me, but like the best way I try to explain it to people is this. If a regulator is coming at you, they really only get pissed off if you're grossly negligent. If you're negligent where you break a rule, they're gonna get unhappy with you. For bankers, you might get an MRA and it's unpleasant, but you'll get through it really quick. Um, but if you are grossly negligent, where you don't have the ability to take back, hey, we need to change this rule to a certain way, then you're getting an MRIA. And then you're in really bad stuff, especially if it's with the Germans or French. Um, and you're really getting into it, right? Because that's what they're looking for is gross negligence. And it all starts around purpose and intent. And so injecting, hey, we collected this data for marketing purposes, but now we're using it in fraud analytics. Is that okay? There needs to be a risk decision. Um, the second part of secure is this concept of um, how do I even need to know about data? I think we're all going through cataloging. And right now as part of cataloging, what I'm seeing is, is we're just assuming we're just gonna like record everything. And the problem is, is, but do I have a need to know about the data in the first place? How do I deal with subscriptions? Who is this person? And I think what's gonna end up happening too is their identity, it's not like they just magically joined that company, right? You have history and audit trail around who you are, what you are, how trustworthy you are. And so we can leverage that to, to automatically decide what you should be subscribed to. And so that has to be part of your design paradigm. And then the third, which I'm about to get to is monitor, which is our new passion. Um, it's this concept of, the way we look at the world has to change, right? So if I, first is, like I said, you get a, if you like utilize this visual as just a, a theoretical kind of game theory here, right? So it's, I'm gonna game out a system of data. First, I wanna discover what we have and tag it, as I said. We wanna know what's sensitive, what con contracts are on certain data, what purposes, et cetera. We need to discover, tag it, curate it, make sure we know about it, and then add subscriptions around it. The second thing though is what we need to do is understand and quantify that risk. We all suck at that. I don't care what anyone says, we all suck at it. It's really, really, really hard because risk is all relative. And so that's what I'm about to talk about in a second because then once we know about that risk, we can remediate it, right? Because we're really good at actually collecting all sorts of telemetry about users, all sorts of telemetry about the data source we brought in. We're good at that, right? Because, and then we can continuously monitor and alert on it. So that second part, understanding and quantifying risk, is, is the hard part. We've got to solve that, right? And that's going to be a community effort. It's not one company, right? I need data from Okta to tell me about this person from maybe the last company they were in. And did they ever have like, you know, nefarious actions on top of a database, right? Or uh, they've never accessed the database before. I want to know that, right? So there's all sorts of different types of user activities I want to know about that are historical. Um, I need to be able to look at the policies on the data. Did someone decide to change that? And all of a sudden that opened up the floodgates. Um, I wanna know, is something weird going on? Like a, da like a data scientist writing select star from all and wanting everything is not abnormal sometimes. It's frustrating and stupid, but they will do it, right? So what is normal? What is the baseline is changing? 
Um, so I need to know about that. And then I need to have an audit of everything that's going on because we're gonna constantly work through this. This is gonna take three, four years for us to figure out how to do monitoring on your data engineering and your kind of data product landscape. And so these are all new capabilities that a whole cohort of applications, uh, like companies like us, are gonna have to build around you. And so you need to be prepared to deliver that data to us so we can notify you, alert you, make you aware of these risks so you can quantify it and do something about it. Um, so with that, um, that's it. It's very high level. I apologize. If anyone wants to go into details, happy to go through it. Um, as I said, uh, you can also reach out to me. Uh, it's my email, and that's definitely not my Twitter. That's our Twitter handle. But um, I don't do tweeting or whatever it's called. Um, but um, And then, I'll, I'll, like I said, I'll be on with Mike Hayes later. Uh, it should be a really great conversation. Uh, he and I are going to probably, because both of us were have spent a good amount of years overseas, we're also going to talk about Russia and Iran and some other fun things. But um, for now, you get to go to something even cooler. So we'll hear from J.P. Morgan and Thompson next.